He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. In the holy name of Jesus. Amen. No one is born able to hear and to speak. At birth, we can hear, but we can't understand. We can speak, but we cannot be understood. It's, I know too well with my young children. <laughs> We lack what we need to translate the thought into words. The baby doesn't hear with comprehension and thus can't also speak with intelligence. Well, this doesn't actually tell us about the child's capability. The aptitude of the child at birth is not an indication of their ability revealed later in life, at least not usually. A typical child comes to hear and then understand, and later understanding is able to form those same words and speak. He develops this ability with the physical and mental resources that God has given him. In a sense, every child has their ears opened and their tongue loosed to speak. Barring a disability, this is God's good and gracious first article gift as creator and sustainer of all things. How does God work this ability in us? He does it through days, months, and years of the child observing and we teaching. The child is, if they are to develop, surrounded by listening and speaking people. The child sees their faces and reads their lips. Such observation of expression is also essential to understand what they're hearing with comprehension. By the way, this is why masks are completely inappropriate for teachers and parents of young children. The hearing and speaking people teach the child through their example and guidance, through facial expression, through lips, to understand basic words, then sentences, and then later complex thoughts. But it's also true that all of nature, not just human nature, but all of creation was cursed by Adam's rebellion against God. And what that means is that what was once completely natural for everyone is now in many and various ways ruined for everybody too. The consequence is uniquely felt by each of us. That means it's for some not they're not able to hear or speak well or even at all. Some are born deformed or by injury or by disease lack physical ability. Others are just simply mentally challenged and the link between the brain and the ears and tongue is somehow broken. Disease and genetic illness can impair and ruin our ability to hear and to speak. Now, we don't know much about the deaf-mute man in the Decapolis today, but it does seem, because he's unable to speak, that he's probably been deaf from birth. But that's not really the point. It's just simply what is. He's a deaf-mute man. His ears were stopped, and his tongue was bound. It's probably not his fault, and it probably wasn't his parents' fault either. His suffering as is the case with all disability, is our experience with the sin-wrecked world. And it's true that none, none of us can escape it. Each of us suffers the consequence of man's rebellion against God differently. But it's worse than that. Because of his disability, there's no hope for this, this man, this deaf-mute man. There's no such thing as, I guess we'd call it Israel sign language, <laughs> Israeli sign language, at least not at this point. Can maybe make motions and communicate in a very limited way. But it's worse than that because he can't hear the news of Jesus. He could never ask to receive the gifts that Christ gives. He was deaf and mute to the world but as a consequence, he was also deaf and mute to God. In other words, 
being deaf, mute to God, he was dead. Dead to the world and dead in his trespasses and sins. If it weren't for his friends, he'd never have discovered Jesus. Of course, that's your life too. Yes, as an infant child, you were intended to be able to hear and to understand and then to, be, to speak. And normally, that's true for all of us. And yet, your situation, like the deaf-mute man, is far worse than any unnatural physical or mental impediment or disability. If we're going to take the scriptures seriously, then we have to believe that every man, woman, and child lacks from birth the ability to hear God, to believe in God, and to confess with their lips God's holy name. We are by nature, the scripture says, children of wrath and unable to believe, trust, and speak in God. That's what it means to be a sinner, deaf and mute. We do not hear God, we don't desire God, and we don't trust God. We certainly don't call upon his name by nature. We lack the ability, reason, or strength to open our own ears or to loose our own tongues. Again, just to summarize, we are born deaf, mute before God. And there's nothing we can do then to speak God's holy name, to listen to his holy word. By nature, then, every word that we hear from God, even the good news of Jesus Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sin, sounds to us like one big lie. Or in the case of the pastor, a raving wild man, madman even. Or perhaps this is just some grand conspiracy to deceive you from reality. By nature, we don't want to believe. We can't believe. We actually won't believe. You might have ears that can hear, but you effectively put your fingers in them. And your tongues may be speaking, but all they're saying is, la, 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 I can't hear you. <laughs> Which is why this story today from history is so important. Because what can Jesus do with we who are deaf and mute? As with all sin and all sin that has, all that sin has corrupted, Jesus comes to us to forgive and to restore us. Forgiveness of sins and new life go together. So Jesus wastes no time. He takes the man aside. He puts his fingers into the man's ears and then touches the man's tongue after spitting and sighs with compassion. Be opened. He speaks. And when Jesus speaks, that deaf mute man's ears were opened and he spoke rightly. That is, he spoke with intelligence. A great miracle has been given to this man. But it shouldn't surprise us. This is, of course, who Jesus is. The word that spoke the whole world into being, let there be, now speaks and says, be opened and recreates. This is the story all through Mark's gospel, which we've been reading in our daily prayer. When Jesus says, be silent, the storm was stilled. When Jesus says, be opened, the ears are opened. When Jesus says, I forgive you your sins, your sins are forgiven and the full and complete wages of sin is paid. And even more than that, what can Jesus do then with the dead? As Jesus has paid the full penalty for sin by his suffering and death on the cross, death no longer holds dominion for all those who are in Jesus. And so Jesus himself can cry out to you with the voice of command, even as you are dust and ashes, and to gather you back into flesh and give you the breath of life and call you out of your grave to the resurrection on the last day, all by name. What Jesus says, Jesus does. So when he says, be opened, ears are opened. And when ears are opened, notice what else happens. 
tongues, too, are loosed to speak. And it didn't stop on that day. Jesus still goes about this world speaking in Aramaic, ephatha, or perhaps just be opened. The healing that Jesus performed for the deaf mute man, he still performs, even now, for us. Jesus did not leave the deaf mute man alone. He did not leave them for dead, and he doesn't for you either. But as I mentioned earlier, there's something curious here. What can a deaf mute man do to believe? Nothing. Why would he even seek after Jesus? He'd have no reason. And notice too that Jesus didn't seek out the man either. Well, at least not directly. Instead, word of what Jesus had done had gone out through the whole region. Tongues had been speaking of the great and mighty works that Jesus had done. The friends of this deaf mute man had heard the word of Jesus, some word of him, and believed that he could provide healing to their friend. They brought the man to Jesus and begged him, begged him to have mercy on him, to heal him. But I think it's more than that. Because they believed in the word that Jesus spoke, they didn't just desire that this man's life be improved and his job prospects, well, that he have any, now being able to hear and to speak. But he, they really wanted their friend to be able to hear the word, the same word that called them, the word of Jesus. And thus, they weren't just caring for his body and for his physical impediment, but rather for his soul. Think about what we confess in the third article of the Creed. We say that we cannot believe, that we confess, that I cannot believe by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord, or even come to him. I believe that I cannot believe. That's what you confess. In other words, again, we're spiritually deaf, mute, and completely unable to hear and to believe. But you remember the rest of the third article. We confess that we are called, gathered, enlightened, and sanctified, not by our reason and strength, but rather by the Holy Spirit as he sanctifies us here in his Christian church. That is, for us, it's Christ Jesus' spirit that opens our ears and teaches us to listen in the midst, in the midst of the communion of saints. And there's the key. Christians bring Christians to the church. Faith is given when the Spirit, Christ's Spirit, speaks. And by speaking, he opens ears. All of us who are deaf and mute by birth had our ears opened by the washing of rebirth and renewal in the Holy Spirit in baptism. Faith, that is trust in Jesus, that belief comes in the midst of Christian community, that is, with other believers. Where Jesus Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins is weekly, even daily, preached, taught, and given out under his body and blood. We, like those friends of the deaf mute man, together are nurtured and sustained with the word of Jesus. And these Christian friends eat and drink of Christ's body and blood together too all receiving together forgiveness of sins. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there's healing, that is life and salvation. So you'll note what Jesus did with this deaf, mute man. He didn't just open his ears, but afterwards, now the man is speaking, and not speaking the gibberish of the toddler. Rather, the bond that held his tongue is removed and he speaks freely understandably. I don't think it's too much to suggest what this deaf, mute, now hearing and speaking man was saying. He spoke right, rightly, that is, well, in Greek, ortholi, that is from where we get orthodoxy, truthfully. To speak rightly is to speak truthfully. He joined in all the crowds that had been hearing Jesus in proclaiming the healing that Christ Jesus gave him. What else was he going to talk about? He sang out with them. He has done all things well. He even makes, makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. So when you hear the good news of Jesus, you are also those who then proclaim the good news of Jesus. 
as we've been doing all day already, you can't but help sing out for joy for what God has done. He has done all things well, you proclaimed. And perhaps, too, you can't help but tell others, your spiritually deaf, mute neighbors, about what Jesus has done to open your ears and to unbind your tongue. Your sins are forgiven. Your death is destroyed. And eternal life is your inheritance. All of this is given to you by Jesus as gift. It's Jesus who today has opened your ears to hear his gospel word of forgiveness, to instill in you that faith, trust, that this gospel is for you, and to confess this miraculous work in creed and in prayer and in song before one another. What I've seen today is the deaf hearing the word of, of Jesus and the mute now speaking Christ's holy name. What a miracle. Thanks be to God in his holy name. Amen.